Um, and I'm going to introduce our speaker. And after I do that, I'm going to launch one poll that's going to then um, uh, transition into her first topic. So welcome again. The topic tonight is plant adaptations to a Mediterranean climate. So tonight you're going to learn about what type of climate defines a Mediterranean climate, um, it's, you know, and what type of what makes this climate unique, and how plants have over time adapted to this climate and the region that we live in. So you'll learn a little bit about not only the climate, but about how to manage plants and um, come away kind of inspired and with a deeper understanding of what beautiful plants um, that are adapted to this beautiful area will grow successfully in our area. And to do that, uh, we have our speaker tonight and it's um, Dawn Kujiman. She will be present, she will be our presenter and speaker tonight. And she currently is our program coordinator for the UC Master Gardener program, both for Alameda and Contra Costa counties, which is part of the UC Cooperative Extension. In addition to all of that, uh, she also has taught plant identification and drought tolerant garden design at UC Berkeley's Department of Landscape Architecture. In addition, she holds a Master's of Landscape Architect, Architecture, excuse me, and is a certified arborist with the International Society of Arboriculture. So Dawn is very knowledgeable and I think you're gonna really enjoy her presentation. Before I give her the floor, there is one question that she wants to ask that she is gonna get right into answering. So a lot of you said, majority of you said, you're very familiar with the Mediterranean climate. I'm gonna test you a little bit. What percentage of the world do you feel has a Mediterranean climate? 2%, 10%, 25%, or 50%? I'll give you guys, all of you, a few seconds to cast your vote and I'll share the answers and then we'll let Dawn dive right into her talk. Okay, we're almost there with about 75% of the folks casting your vote. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Looks like most people have cast their vote and I'm gonna share. So 2% of you, 20, or excuse me, 28% of you felt 2% of the world's pop, uh, population is a Mediterranean climate. 35% um, felt 10%, 29%, 25% of the world, and 7% of you felt 50%. So I'm gonna let, give Dawn officially now the virtual floor and let her go in to tell us if, which is the right answer among other things. Go ahead, Dawn. Um, Don, you're muted. I had to um, go back in. I'm going to reshare the screen here. If you can bear with me for just one moment. Okay, so we just did the poll where we asked about how many, how much of our world is has Mediterranean climate. And the answer is that it is only about 2%. It's a really rare climate. And it's found, um, you, can, you can see, in two equidistant bands on either side of the equator, um, mostly around the Mediterranean Sea, but also a little bit in California, a little bit in Chile, um, a little tiny bit in South Africa, and a bit in Australia. And notice that in Australia, it's not the entire continent of Australia. It really is only two locations. I am having trouble with my advancing. There we go. So it, as I said, it's only about 2% of the to total world's land mass. And I think that it's kind of nice to see this pie chart. You can see most of it, not surprisingly, is right around the Mediterranean Sea itself. And um, mostly on the western side of the continent and also moderated by large bodies of water. Um, water tends to temper the climate and make it um, more moderate. 
So um, you may have noticed in the polls, um, sometimes Mediterranean, you may see as capitalized, which is a proper noun, but it's also correct to use it as an adjective and not capitalize it. So I, I say that I used to teach um, and to, so to capitalize or not to capitalize, it's not an editor's error. It, it is a correct um, use when you're using Mediterranean as an adjective. So the characteristics of this climate are short, mild, and rainy winters. And the summers are long, they're warm to hot, and they are dry. Another thing, of course, is that they tend to be on the western side of the continent. And one of the reasons I wanted to ask to have that poll about where people grew up, you know, we had about half of the people were from California, um, but a lot of people from the, the back from the east, from the Midwest, from the south, other western states, and from other parts of the world. And the reason I wanted to ask that is that this climate is pretty rare. 2% of the world has Mediterranean climate. But if you grew up with this climate, as I did, I thought it was normal. I thought it was a normal thing. In the summertime, it's warm, it's summertime, there's no school, and it didn't rain. And my childhood chore was to water the lawn, and I just thought that went part and parcel with it being summer. Um, then as a young adult, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I distinctly remember just being shocked about it raining in the summertime and distinctly being talking to my mother in August saying, I can't believe it. I, it. The lawn is still green and I haven't had to water all summer. Um, maybe that says a little bit about, about me and my knowledge base, but it's really unusual. And I know that people who move to California from other parts of the country often are surprised at how dry it is and also surprised with, um, we have plants that go um, lose their leaves in the summertime. And I'll be talking about things like that in just a little bit. So rain in the winter, hot and dry in the summer, and on the west side of the continents, and also the large bodies of water. So one of the characteristics about California's Mediterranean climate that's a little bit different from other parts of the world is that our summers are drier. Um, Russ Beatty, who used to be at the Department of Landscape Architecture, and he's a landscape architect and a, a writer, he wrote that California is considered more Mediterranean than that of the Mediterranean basin itself. And by that, what he meant is that in most of the other Mediterranean climates throughout the world, um, about two thirds of the rainfall falls in the wintertime which means about a third of the remaining year there's rain. Whereas in California, we get almost all of our rain during the rainy season in the winter, about 85%. And what that translates to is that our summers are relatively drier than other places in the world that have a similar climate. What that means practically in terms of your of your garden and again it depends on where you live in the bay area if you are on the bay side of course it's different than if you are on the other side of the coast ranges but a lot of mediterranean plants especially those that are from other parts of the world if you are in the more inland areas where it gets quite warm they may need a little bit of water in the summertime to keep them looking good um, and that's because it's just drier here in california um, when we're talking about rainfall, it's not enough just to say, oh, this city, this town, this country, this state gets so many inches of rain per year. Um, you really have to look not at the annual precipitation, but you really need to look at the distribution, how it falls over the course of the year. So I took um, three cities in the US, I took Berkeley, um, and these are three cities that have about 24 inches of rainfall every year. I took Berkeley, I took Tierra Amarilla in New Mexico, and I took Merrifield, Minnesota. And what I want you to notice is that they all have about 24 inches of rain, but how it falls over the course of the year is really different. So if you look at Berkeley, what you see is we get a little bit of rain in the fall, a lot of rain in the winter, a little bit in the spring and hardly 
any in the summertime. Whereas if you look at this town in New Mexico, what you'll see is the rainfall is pretty even throughout the year. They get a little bit in the fall, a little bit in the winter, a little bit in the spring, and a little bit in the summer, if you think about those summer desert thunderstorms. Um, in Minnesota, in this town in Minnesota, they get a little bit in the fall, very little in the wintertime. I have the feeling it's probably just too cold a little bit in the spring, but most of the rainfall in this town in Minnesota happens in the summertime. So this is really something that's important to think about, not just how much rain we're getting, but when it, when it comes to us. So the next thing I wanna look at are these two graphs that were put together by Sean O'Hara, who works with the um, gardening in the world's Mediterranean climate. And I think that these graphs are absolutely brilliant. He took um, climate patterns and he looked at non-Mediterranean climates and in this side. And the blue is the average rainfall, the yellow is the temperature, and the green is that what he extrapolates as the best growing season. So he took, looked at cities all over the world, Atlanta, Boston, Charleston, South Carolina, Ottawa, Paris, um, Paris, France, not Paris, Texas, um, Sydney, Tokyo, Washington, DC. And this is what he averaged out. This chart starts from the winter, it goes to the spring, then to the summer, through the autumn, and into the winter. And what you'll see is in the wintertime, of course, that's when it's the coldest. And then as we get into the spring, it gets warmer, of course, warmest in the summertime. And then it gets cooler as we, the winter approaches. But look at the rainfall pattern. For the most part, you have some rain in the winter and it either stays relatively flat through the year, which means it's raining fairly regularly across the course of the year, or, it goes up in the summertime. And so when you put this combination of available rainfall with the warm warmth of the spring, summer, and early fall, what you see is a, a prime growing season in the summertime. Now contrast this to our Mediterranean climate. And again, it's the same um, x-axis where we're going from winter through spring to the summer and back to the winter. And again, of course, the temperature patterns are the same. Um, you know, cool, colder in the winter, gets warmer in the summer, and then, um, of course, cools off as we get into the fall, into the winter again. But look at the difference with the way the rainfall fall comes over the course of the year. We have most of our rain in the winter time, and then it really drops off. Wow, really goes down, down, down in the summer. We occasionally get late fall rains, we had some what we would consider unseasonable thunderstorms a couple of weeks ago, very um, unusual for us. Generally, we get a little bit of rain starting in the fall, usually in October into November and into December. But look at when you look at the combination of heat, warmth, and water, what you'll see that this is a little bit hard for the plants. And Maybe with our better growing season is coming out of the winter, going into the spring as the temperature is starting to go up and as we're getting the rainfall. And all to understand this, all you really have to do is look at our East Bay Hills. When they are green is when it's raining. And then in the summertime, they are brown. Um, go, they go from being golden to being brown to being bleached out. And that is just, um, again, typical of a Mediterranean climate pattern. So now we have another poll. We sure do. Let me go ahead and launch that. So this ties into what Don was just talking about. I'm curious what your thoughts are, true or false? Droughts are a rare occurrence in California. Go ahead and take a few seconds. Cast in what you think. It's a 50-50 chance. <laughs> okay, almost all of you cast your vote. All right, I'm going to end the poll. About 90% of you shared your thoughts. Let's share the results. And then we'll let Dawn tell you which is the correct answer. 
Are droughts, droughts are rare occurrences? 5% said true, and 95% of you thought the right answer was false. Dawn, I'll let you so hear the real answer. We have a very knowledgeable group today. So droughts are typical in California. Um, so what I wanna talk a little bit about next is about California climate and the drought. Um, and what I wanna say is that droughts are normal and maybe not particularly new. Um, droughts are also typical for in Mediterranean climate. It is just part of the climate cycle. So for some background, what I want to talk about is that droughts are typical in California. And we have people who study climate and study drought. Um, climate scientists in some ways are like geologists, which is that they look at long spans of time, maybe not as long as, as well, some do, geology, but looking at more than the last five years or the last 10 years. And one of the ways that um, climate scientists can get a sense of how long um, and when we had droughts is by looking at tree rings. And the people who study that are called dendrochronologists. Um, dendro is from the Greek word for tree. And then of course, chronology has to do with time. So about a thousand years ago, it was so dry that Fallen Leaf Lake, Fallen Leaf Lake south of Lake Tahoe was completely drained. Um, in 1580, it was so dry that the giant sequoias of the Sierra really registered very little to no growth. And I think what's really interesting about this 1580 date is that if you are, if you know California history, um, Sir Francis Drake landed in 1579. And he writes about how terrible, terrible, what this new land that he found was. And I think it's because he, of course, coming from Europe, uh, forests, um, summer rainfall, and then to land in California where there weren't forests. Um, he landed in the late summer, early fall. It was very, very dry. And coupled with that, it was a very, very dry year. So, um, so this is you know, looking 500 years ago, very dry. Um, we don't actually have weather records for California. The official state weather records started in about 1895. So we have just over 100 years of official weather records. However, in San Francisco, they, there are weather records that go back to 1850. So why is this important? It turns out that the 20th century was a particularly wet century. And that, when you think about when all of our water infrastructure was put in, into the state of California after World War II, it was predicated on a fairly wet century, which now we realize was a little bit atypical. So that is um, kind of an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is just rainfall in California. This is about a hundred year um, graph. And it goes from about 1900 to about you know, 2015 or so. And this line down the middle is the average. And what I want you to notice about this graph is that there are very, very few average years. Um, if you count them, you know, there are about 20 over this 100 year period. Um, it varies wildly from year to year. We go from having a drought year to having an average year to having an El Nino year. I mean, it is all over the place. So it's very unpredictable. So the idea of there being average rainfall is, um, you know, it's a, it's a number. It's not anything that kind of is predictive of um, what's going to happen next. Um, this um, is a series of graphs that were put together for a story that was in the San Francisco Chronicle about five or six years ago. And it is research that was put together by Noah Diffenbach at Stanford University. And I think, again, I think the graphs are, are pretty, pretty telling. Um, the first one, of course, is what we just looked at was um, precipitation. And again, you can see this, you know, really wildly fluctuating pattern. And then these dots are what are the drought years. And this line going through the middle is the average. 
And then the second one is looking at temperatures, average temperatures. And again, we're looking at trends here. What we're seeing are um, increasing temperatures over the course of 100 years. And again, these dots are the, the drought years. The last one is looking what is at what is called the soil moisture index. And this was put together, it goes through in 2014. So it's about from five years ago, but I think this will help you understand what happened with our trees in the Sierras and why they got so stressed and why we've had such high tree mortality, which is there's water available in the soil, but after a number of warmer years, coupled with not a lot of precipitation, there just wasn't very much soil water left in the soil for the trees to access. And this is an incredible strain on, on trees. So that's a little bit to sort of put together how um, all of these things work in tandem, how much rain we get, what our typical temperatures are, and then what, how much water is available in the soil for our na native growing plants. The next thing I want to talk a little bit about is just people. There are simply more of us in California. I put this graph together. This is based on the census data from 2010. So if you haven't taken the census, be sure you take the census. I'll do a little plug right here. So I looked at, you know, the California is the blue line and you can see it gets fairly steep right here. Um, this is 1940, 1945. So what we're seeing here, right in here are people coming to California to work in the war industries, in the shipyards, in the Bay Area, in the airline, aircraft industry in Southern California. But I was curious about how this population compared to other places in um, other states. So I looked at Texas, um, I looked at New York because I know people are always you know, wanting to move to New York for economic opportunity. I was curious about North Carolina. North Carolina, of course, has a very large, or they used to before the pandemic, large convention industry and, and NASCAR, you know, and it's all pretty flat. And then I was also curious about um, West Virginia and Wyoming, which have, you know, fewer economic opportunities. And what you'll see there is the population is really pretty flat. But California, um, along with Texas and New York, you see kind of an acceleration of population. So more of us making demands on a finite resource which we have in our water. The next thing I wanted to talk about this something is called the U.S. Drought Monitor and they um, this is a uh, done by a number of, of agencies that work together the USDA for example the um, NOAA as well and they put together these maps. They come out every, they're published every Thursday and it's for the entire US. So you can look at this drought map for the entire contiguous um, United States or you can pull out selected states. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to compare last January, January of, of 2019, and you can see most of the state was under a drought. Um, except for this you know, area in the Sierras here, the darker the color, the more severe the drought. Um, and I was curious how last January compared to this January. And if you remember, we had some good rain early on. And this year um, in January, um, we didn't really have drought occurrences throughout the state. Um, but again, thinking it, it, this really, it varies it, from year to year to year. So this was the beginning of the year in kind of the middle of our rainy season in January. And then this is where we are now. So I pulled this off of the website on Thursday. So you can see, again, most of our state, again, is under drought conditions. Whereas last year, um, it wasn't. So in any case, it changes from year to year. And I think what I want you to understand is the variability of drought, but it's always, it's always here. It may not be here this month, it may not be here in January, but chances are it's gonna be right, right around the corny, corner for us. And to really think about that um, in planning what you're gonna do in your garden and make very thoughtful um, choices about what kind of plants you're gonna use and where you're gonna water and, and what you're gonna water. 
so now I'm going to get to what I would is the kind of the center of, of this talk, which is talking about plants, which is my one of my very favorite topics. And I want to talk about how plants that evolved in Mediterranean climates have adapted. So first of all, like, you know, water, who cares? Why is water so important? Um, water is critical for photosynthesis. Water um, supplies a number of functions in the plant, including it's what holds plants up. You know, when plants wilt, that's because they don't have enough, um, they're not getting enough water to plump up their leaves and stems to hold them up. But also water is critical for photosynthesis. And of course, with no photosynthesis, there's no plant life and there would be no, you know, we wouldn't be here either. So of course, you know, you, um, you, the plants take in carbon dioxide and water. I love this little diagram. I like to say magic happens in the leaves with the photosynthesis, photosynthesis and the plant manufactures sugar and then lets off oxygen. So without water, plants can't photosynthesize. If they can't photosynthesize or their, photosynth their um, ability to pho photosynthesize is slowed down because there's not as much water, they can't grow and function as fast or as much as they can when they have adequate water. So that brings me back to this graph. So it's pretty, I think it's pretty um, understandable that this green area here for the non-Mediterranean climates, we have, you know, nice warm temperatures and adequate rainfall and things want to grow. But let's think about where we are in California with our Mediterranean climate. Um, what I want to explore here is why doesn't everything just die? Here we have our summers, we have little water. As we go through the summer, the water that's stored in the soil is either used up or evaporates. So there's, as we go through the summer, there's less and less water available. And then that is coupled with summertime temperatures where it's warm and the sun is shining and water is evaporating. So my question is, why doesn't everything just die? Why isn't everything dead right now in this, you know, why do we have any plants here? And what has happened is plants who, that evolved in these Mediterranean climates, and of course plants and, you know, the whole ecosystem involves in tandem with microclimate, with soils, with the plants, with water. Um, how did the plants evolve in a way that allows them to make it from the winter or the spring through the dry and warm season back into the cooler and wetter season? So plants have evolved two main strategies. We have what are called the drought resistors and we have what are called the drought evaders. And I'm going to first talk about the drought resistors. So what we see with drought resistors are a, a lot of different adaptations that have to do with their leaves, with their foliage. So the first adaptation I want to talk about is what's called sclerophyll leaves. So sclero means hard. So you probably know that word from, you know, arterial sclerosis, hardening of the arteries. Phil, of course, means leaves. So I guess this is redundant, sclerophyll leaves. And what this means is that they are, they are hard, they're tough, they're leathery. And that tough leathery leaf is resistant to dehydration. Um, they're typically evergreen. Um, they're often very thick. Um, they sometimes have a waxy coating on them that helps um, reduce water la loss through evaporation. And then the stomata, and this is a microscope picture of stomata. These are cells, guard cells, that are on the underside of the leaf. And the guard cells, in they close up this first one is closed up and what happens is the this is through this opening is how water vapor and and gases mostly carbon dioxide and and oxygen go in and out of the leaf surface these are typically on the bottoms of the leaves you need to have a, a microscope to see them and in plants that evolved in non-mediterranean climate these stomata are often open 
The word for stomata is from the Greek word for mouth. And you can see that this does look a little bit like a mouth, a sideways mouth with the way this picture is oriented. And in plants that are from non-Mediterranean climates, often these um, stomata are open during the daytime to allow water vapor and, and gas exchange. Um, but a lot of plants that are evolved with the Mediterranean climate actually close their stomata um, during the day to help reduce water loss. And what that means is they can't photosynthesize as much, but it does help um, with water conservation within the leaves. So I want to, you know, now we have some pretty pictures. So I think a real, um, a plant probably most of you are familiar with are our native oaks, our coast live oaks. And if you've ever, you know, touched these leaves or, you know, handled them, um, you know, they're super hard. The, they have prickles that is to discourage browsing from deer, but they're really hard. They almost feel um, plastically, they're thick, they're hard. And this is an example of one of those sclerophyll leaves. So our native coast live oak. We also see um, this in all kinds of plants. Here's an example of um, Corymbia fissifolia. This you may know this is a eucalyptus. I've noticed in my neighborhood that they're starting to bloom now. This is the red flowering gum. And they too have a very tough, leathery leaf. Um, and then this is just kind of an interesting thing that um, eucalyptus globulus does. These are our blue gums. This is the plant that every, the tree everyone loves to argue endlessly about. But they do something really, really interesting, which is the plant, the leaves, um, rather than being um, out flat this way, they hang vertically. And what this does is it helps reduce the leaf's exposure to sunlight. So the leaf is going to be less likely to lose water through evaporation. So we see that these plant leaves that are, are hanging up and down. We see this in Eucalyptus globulus. Um, but we also see this, for example, in Manzanita. Um, again, the leaves are oriented on the plant up and down. They are not going to be able to capture as much sunlight to photosynthesize, but the plant is prioritizing water conservation by having its leaves be vertically, vertical. Um, another thing that is an, an adaptation to living in forests that the blue gums do is that they have something called vert, um, juvenile foliage. And here's for scale is my dog and my hand. And what you can see is these leaves look very, very different from the leaves in this slide. Um, these mature leaves are leathery, they're hanging down and they're a different shape. Um, in juvenile growth in eucalyptus, we have these large flat leaves that increase access to sunlight. There's a lot of competition for sunlight and resources growing under these eucalyptus woodlands. And so this is the way plants have adapted um, to sort of be able to um, access the sunlight to increase photosynthesis so they can continue to, to grow. And then at some point, um, there is a trigger and the plants go from having these, the juvenile foliage, which has a very different look. You can see in this picture, this was taken up in Wildcat Canyon um, in the East Bay Regional Parks District, you can see the leaves are very blue, they're flat, they're oriented going um, horizontally. And then this, with this growth, you can see these are more green and that they are a smaller, um, a smaller leaf. So it is just another adaptation to being in a harsh condition. Another drought resisting strategy that we'll see is having hairy leaves or fuzzy leaves. Um, if you think about um, plants that do well uh, with little water, you'll notice a lot of them are fuzzy and many of them are gray or blue. And there's a reason for that. Again, this is an adaptation to not having a lot of available water in the summertime. And so you can see in this picture, even the little leaf hairs right here, you also see this light color. And so what the hairy or the fuzzy leaf surface does is a couple of things. One is the fuzz provides a teeny tiny bit of shade for the leaf to help keep it cool. And then also in the morning, if there has been any water in terms in, in the air that came overnight, 
it condenses between these hairs and it sort of holds on to the onto the those little droplets and the, as that water evaporates it helps keep the leaf cool and thus slows the loss of water through the leaf so this fuzz not only is it um, kind of pretty and fun um, you know kids love to pet these soft fuzzy plants but it's also um, providing a function to the leaf in terms of keeping it cool and reducing water loss. Um, and this coastal sagewort, this is one of our California native plants. Um, you can also see it on this Pleptranthus. This is a plant native to elsewhere in the world. And what I wanted to show with this is that you can see that underneath the fuzz, this plant is still green. It's still able to photosynthesize, but it is covered with this fuzz. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about ferns. I think we, you know, if you close your eyes and you think about ferns, you often associate ferns with damp places, um, with grottos, with dripping water and moss, and maybe there's a little nymph hiding out in the corner behind this very cool and green um, scenario. And that's a, a, a picture that I, I often associate with ferns. But we furnish a kind of plant, and there are actually drought resistant ferns. This is one that's called Chelanthus. This is actually occasionally available at your local nursery. Um, these are native to desert areas, um, and they do, you, if you look carefully, they also have a hairy or a fuzzy leaf surface. So there, if you go to the um, University of California Botanic Garden, there is a whole display of these drought ferns. It's really pretty interesting. They are from desert climates. However, they do tend to grow really close adjacent to rocks. And of course, the rock is on the ground and the water is going to be conserved under the rock. So they do tend to grow in the damper parts. But um, I think it's uh, pretty surprising to think that we do have drought adapted ferns. Um, I put this picture in because it's just so dramatic. This is per uh, purple um, Berlea, and it almost looks like it's covered with spider webs because it has so much hair on it. And again, that, that hairy surface, kind of cobwebby surface, is help providing a little bit of shade. It's helped capture, if there's any little bit of water in the atmosphere, it captures that water and helps cool the plant. Um, now this one, this Velvet Centauria is a plant, it's also a little bit fuzzy, not quite as dramatically fuzzy as the plants in the previous slides, but it has this gray color. And you think about gray and you think about light colors, the light color will help reflect the sunlight. And that is again, a way to help the plant protect its water resources so it doesn't warm up quite as quickly. So. Um, this is a very, very attractive plant. It gets little um, pinky purple flowers. Um, we also have um, in this composition, this dichondra is also fairly fuzzy. This is Silver Falls. And this um, is kind of a nice combination. It's um, in combination with an Echeveria. So when even when you have plants that are similar colors, you can do some pretty interesting things by con um, combining textures and forms and colors. Yet another um, foliage adaptation is what is called being glaucous. And being glaucous is when the foliage is covered again with a grayish or a bluish waxy coating. So this is Dianella baby bliss. It's a plant that's mostly grown for its foliage. It has this very attractive bluey green vertical foliage. It does get itty bitty blue flowers, but it really is grown more for its foliage. And it is covered with this blue green waxy coating. And again, that is a way that the plant is, um, it's not able to lose the water. It's not going to be able to photosynthesize as quickly, but it does help with conserving the plant's water. Um, another thing that we see a lot on succulents is something that's called farinos powder. And the word farinos is from the word for farina, coming from flour, the kind of flour that you make biscuits with, not the kind of flowers in your garden. And so this is a powder that covers, um, you'll see this on a lot of succulents. This one is a giant chalk, Dudleya. 
And what this powder does is it's almost like a sunscreen. It's almost like putting a coat of zinc oxide on your plant. Um, it protects the plant from getting burned. It helps reflect the light. This particular plant is very, very white, so it is going to be reflecting the light. Um, if you have, if you or anyone you know is uh, totally crazy about succulents, and I know succulents are so popular right now, um, some people get very upset if you touch them. And the reason for that is if you look at this picture, if you look right here, and you look right here, and you look right here, what you're seeing, you'll see this greenish underneath. This, these are fingerprints. These are places where people have actually touched and wiped that powder off. And what this does is it's, you know, it's unattractive for us. You know, I think people love this plant because of this, this glowing white color. But when the powder gets wiped off, it, it's not like the chameleon's tail. The plants are not able to regenerate this powder. And this opens the plant up for sunburn. So um, this bloom or Farinose powder is another way that the plant is able to reflect the sunlight and then um, help not get so hot and lose water as quickly. It doesn't have to be white. This is kind of a fun picture of a Graptopetalum that is very, very purple. And again, succulents, you see all different kinds of color, but many of them have this powder on them. If you wipe the powder off, which you shouldn't do because it protects the plant, you'll often see underneath the plant is green or red. And um, reddish is um, another way that plants kind of protect themselves from the sunlight. So um, the Farinose powder. Um, yet another, see there are many, many ways that leaves have adapted. Another adaptation is for teeny tiny leaves. Um, the smaller the leaf, there's less surface area to lose water. So we often see a lot of plants that are adapted to low summer water that have teeny tiny leaves. This is a California native. This is our California lilac Vandenberg Ceanothus, and it was actually found near the Vandenberg Air Force Base. And I happened to have a dime with me the day that I, I was, um, saw this plant to give you a sense of the scale. I mean, the leaves are itty bitty. They're, the plant is what we would call densely clothed. That It has a lot of leaves on it, but they are all very, very tiny. Um, this is another plant that has tiny needle-like leaves. Um, this is Bakia vergata. This is from New Zealand. Um, um, it's a very graceful plant, but again, tiny leaves. And it's also um, a dark green plant, um, which is kind of a nice thing to notice, you know, with these drought tolerant plants, because there are so many plants that are grays and blues. It's always nice to notice the plants that have the green foliage. Um, another thing that plants do is some plants have what is called seasonal dimorphism. So di means two and morph means shape. Um, they're usually low shrubs and what I have shown here is um, this is a Jerusalem sage, Flumus ruticosa, and the, this picture is one of our um, purple native California sages. And what happens is the, the plants are, are, are pretty smart here. So what happens is in the early spring, so if you go back and you think about what's happening in the early spring, the um, weather, it's starting to warm up, the days are getting longer, but there is still a little bit of rain falling and certainly water available in the ground. So what happens is the plant says, I'm gonna grow as fast as I can. I'm gonna make large leaves, the large leaves, of course, allow more surface area so the plants can photosynthesize and make more sugars, uh, make more energy and grow faster. So they're gonna grow as fast as they can with bigger leaves while the going is good, while the weather is still warm before it's gotten too dry. But at a certain point in the summer, once the water gets to be less and less available, the plant growth slows down and the leaves may become smaller. So this is nothing to be concerned about. It is just sort of following the climate pattern and conserving, conserving energy. The plant is conserving its resources. Smaller leaves, less water loss. 
Um, and then once the plant, um, we get back into the rain the next year, it'll, it'll put a fresh flush of growth out. Um, plants are also able to store water in different parts of their plant. For example, um, this is a very peculiar plant. This is called giant Coreopsis. It's native to Southern California, and it is giant. There's, I didn't have my dog with me, actually. My dog is not allowed in this garden. This is taken up at the Tilden, the Regional Parks Botanic Garden, which is a wonderful place to go see California natives. Um, it's about five feet tall. It's, you don't get a sense of the scale. But this plant has the ability to store water in its stems. I have not been there um, at the end of the summer, but at this time of the year, this was taken in the spring. At this time of the year, the leaves um, would be dried up and this would be just a shriveled up nothing thing. But once it starts to rain, it puts out its leaves and it grows and it blooms. Uh, trees are also able to store water in their trunks. This is a, a bottle tree. Um, there are many, many of these bottle trees um, from um, Australia and there are also some from Africa. Plants also, and this is going back to succulents, plants can also store water in their leaves. Um, this is an eonium, and even though these look like little roses, these are actually leaf rosettes that are storing water. And cactus are also considered succulents because they too can store water. Cactus is a botanic family of plants. All cactus are succulents but not all succulents are cactus. And so here's a picture of a prickly pear, and this paddle is actually the stem of the plant that has evolved, and the leaves are evolved down to be spines and these little prickly things around the base of the spine. So this is another way of protecting water. And also, of course, if you're covered with spines, nobody's gonna come and eat you and steal your water. So it's a, it's a defense against predation. So we have a, one more poll right now, quickly. Great, let's launch that really quickly. Um, so this is just to kind of review, a drought resistant strategies include, check um, which answer you feel best uh, represents the question, tough leathery green, evergreen leaves, gray fuzzy leaves, tiny leaves, or all of the above. We have lots of folks coming in. You votes are coming in quick. Give it a few more seconds. I think everyone's been listening by the vote of it. I'm yeah. going to end the poll and share the results. Yeah, so um, just about everybody got all of them. Um, tough leathery leaves, gray fuzzy leaves, and the tiny leaves are all typical um, adaptations. So the next thing I would like to talk about, I know it takes the Zoom a minute to recover from the poll. Let me advance my slide. R, next, the drought evaders. And I like to say, think of drought evaders as being, um, they just kind of go away. Um, when the going gets tough. When we get into the summer, as the days get longer, as it gets drier and drier, um, the drought evaders basically say, I'm going to take my ball and go home and I'll come back when it's a little bit nicer out. So the first plant I want to talk about is our California buckeye, Aeschylus californica. And for, I know we have a lot of people on this call that are from other parts of the country. And I know that people that are new to California have a really hard time with this idea that we have plants that go, um, that become deciduous in the summertime. Um, here's a picture of the, of the tree in the, in the late spring. You can see the grasses are already starting to dry up in this picture, but it has its leaves, it's in bloom. By the end of the summer, and again, you can see how dry the ground is, the plant loses its leaves. And plants losing their leaves really are a response to environmental stress. Um, even um, the sugar maples in the Northeast, you know, they, all of those deciduous, fall deciduous trees are losing their leaves in response to what is the climate stress in a temperate climate, which is the winter time with the cold and freezing temperatures. Um, we also have um, drought evaders in terms of what are called geophytes. Geo land, fight is lover. 
And we'll move, we can just call these bulbs. Botanically, bulbs has a very specific meaning, but we can just go ahead and call these bulbs. Um, so bulbs are a way that the plants can store water and nutrients underground. They often bloom in the spring and the summer. But being underground, okay, so they completely go away. So this is the evader. You don't even know they're there until they bloom. Um, and they're clever. Bulbs can reproduce not only by making seeds from their flowers, but if they don't bloom, say the environmental conditions are not um, adequate for the plant to um, make a bud and flower. That, of course, is all done in the previous season in the bulb. Um, bulbs can also multiply by making offsets. So that is kind of a belt and suspenders for the, for the bulbs to be able to make more. And the thing with bulbs is they can remain dormant for years until the um, environmental conditions are proper. Um, I used to work in a really large garden and we had um, shooting stars, dodecantheons, and they only bloomed every few years. And every, you know, did they die? Did, you know, did they bloom? Are they gone? Did they disappear? And then something would happen. The rain and the temperature would be proper and they would bloom and come back. Um, I think the most typical um, bulb that we think of um, for bulbs are often tulips. And tulips are actually not from Holland. Um, the Dutch were great traders. They were um, great with um, um, trading and, and making lots of money for the banking system. But tulips are actually native to Afghanistan and to the Middle East. And they are from very, very harsh conditions very cold, very hot, um, very rocky and nutrient poor soils. So the Dutch took them and hybridized them and made them into a commodity, but um, tulips themselves are actually from the Mideast. We have a lot of bulbs that are California native bulbs. They are not particularly available in the trade. They tend to be very specific for their environmental conditions. And what that, be, what that translates into garden speak is hard to grow. They tend to need very specific uh, soil concerns, very specific drainage, um, but we do have a lot of bulbs in our California native flora. This is one that's the Mariposa lily. Um, they are absolutely beautiful when they bloom. Um, they bloom and then they just, they native to the grasslands and then they just vanish from year to year. Um, we also have annuals and an annual is a plant that completes its entire life cycle in one year. There's nothing you can do to make it go longer. Um, if you've ever grown basil, you'll, um, you'll be told or you, you know, you, you know, keep pinching off the flowers, you know, it'll grow and it'll grow. But at some point, no matter how much you pinch off the flowers, it just stops growing. That's an example of a true annual. A lot of plants that are considered annuals, if you read um, a, a gardening book that talks about annuals, a lot of those plants in their native habitat are actually perennials. So when I'm talking about an annual, I'm talking about a plant that the seed germinates, it grows, it flowers, it makes seeds, and it dies in one year. Um, and again, we have a lot of annuals in our California native flora and the seeds can live, they can stay dormant in the soil for years, again, like the bulbs, until the conditions are right for them to germinate. Um, so I have some pretty pictures. This is globe gilia, this gilia capitata. Um, and um, I think this is baby blue eyes, I know is a favorite among so many people, baby blue eyes and tidy tips. These are um, California wildflowers that are um, annuals. And again, these are typical um, with Mediterranean climate because when, when do these things bloom? They bloom in the spring. Think about when the hills are green. And then once it starts to dry out and gets hot, they just die and they wait until the conditions are right. So that's what I mean by a drought evader. So when we talk about, in summary, plant strategies for surviving drought, we have these two strat strategies, the resistors and the evaders. And so when, I want, when you're thinking about drought resistors, they kind of have a certain look. They often have you know, dark green leathery leaves. Um, when I was a student taking plant ID, my, um, 
my fellow students and I would just lament about California native shrubs that had another California native shrub with dark green leathery leaves. There are a lot of them. And how are we gonna to learn to tell them apart? Well, the reason there's so many of them is because that is an adaptation to our dry summers. Um, we talked a little bit about fuzzy leaves and gray leaves and tiny leaves, a lot of things with tiny leaves and plants that can store their water in their leaves and stems, which gives them kind of a more sculptural appearance. And the reason I wanted to kind of call out these categories is that when you're starting to put plants together in a garden situation or in a landscape situation, if you have a lot of dark green leathery leaves, it's all going to kind of blur together. If you have too many gray things, it's all going to kind of blur together. If you have too many little leaves, so you really want to think about setting things off against each other to play off of the color and the texture. Um, and then with the drought evaders is that they are absent or dormant for part of the year. And that actually gives you some seasonal variation. If you can figure out ways to incorporate bulbs, to figure out ways to incorporate annuals, that will give you some um, really nice things that change over the course of the year, but they can completely go away. Um, I wanted to close with some further thoughts about seasonality. Um, here is what we think of winter. We think of snow on the ground, dormant trees, um, someone needs to shovel the walkway here. And then we think of the spring. You can see the leaves, the trees have not yet leafed out. It's early spring, but you see the uh, forsythia, the flowering shrubs are starting to bloom. These are uh, lots of daffodils. Um, winter and spring, then on to summer. We have seasons here too, but our seasons are different. And I just wanna say that we need to embrace our seasonalities. Um, here we have, you know, the beautiful green, lush, you know, summer, or excuse me, spring rains where everything is green. And this is okay. This is how it is here. People look at this and they think, wow, if we just add water, we can have this, which is true if we just add water. And in California, we are really fortunate that we can grow just about anything here. Um, with the exception perhaps of like really good dogwoods and really in lilies of the valley, things that really need a cold season, if we just add water. But what I want you to think about is people don't look at this and say, if I just added heat, I could grow whatever I wanted. And when you add heat to this, you have what's called a greenhouse. So when thinking about using water, I just want to encourage you to be thoughtful and, and make conscious decisions about where you're going to use your water in your landscape. Um, I wanted to end with, again, just some pictures of some plant combinations that I thought were particularly nice. And again, these are all low water landscapes. Um, in the announcement about this talk, um, I wrote that a, a low water or a drought tolerant landscape doesn't have to be just a sea of rocks with an occasional plant. Um, that's a style, um, but it's not the only style. You can have a lush landscape with careful plant choices. So what we have here are some um, vertical plants that are a little bit of a darker green. With This is a plectranthus. It's a sort of a slightly succulent plant, but what I want you to notice is the verticality and the color. The dark green combined with the little round leaves that are a little bit lighter. And notice how densely things are planted. They're very close together. Um, this is a nice um, uh, flower border along a walkway. Um, this is our California pitcher sage. It has a nice spike of red flowers. It's great for hummingbirds and butterflies and bees. And you'll notice this kind of haze of purple um, and white. This is a buckwheat. This is a sal salvia. Um, what's really nice about the pitcher sage is that it has a nice bright green leaf and it's kind of big. So this big leaf, I think, contrasts nicely against the fine texture of this purple plant and with this. So again, thinking about how you put things together and thinking about things that'll make a visual impact. This is at the Striving Arboretum. Um, again, notice just the way, again, notice how densely it's planted. Um, we have these um, accent of the purple with this nice big, it's kind of a starburst with this yucca. 
this um, white trunk of the palm, a little bit of orange here against kind of a, a grayish light green background that all kind of plays off each other. This is also with the Striving Arboretum. And again, I just want you to notice the combinations we have. And this again, it's a low water landscape. It's not a no water landscape, it's a low water landscape. But notice the light colored here, the darker and finer texture, the way the purple is used. Agapanthus is a plant that we tend to sort of dismiss because it's so commonly used, but it really, it's, um, it's quite dramatic. And um, again, we have a lot of things going on in this combination. Um, succulents, again, look at the colors, look at the textures, look at the forms, all kind of playing off and making a really visually engaging composition. Um, one last picture looking at um, repeating use. We have purple vertical, we have a grayer vertical, a greener vertical. Um, again, played off against a background of a nice uh, green background and then a little bit of red with the flower stalks on this uh, playing off the red of the bench here. So I hope that this has given you um, some things to think about, um, understanding a little bit about our, our Mediterranean climate, about how plants have adapted um, a variety of ways to go through a dry summer. And even though um, we, you can, what I want you to go away is that you can do all kinds of amazing things, beautiful things in a garden that is low water. And with that, um, that's the um, close of my talk. Great, thank you, Dawn. Lots of really great information. We have a couple, we have a handful of questions I'll go through. And if everyone could stay tight, we have some information on how to get the handout at the very end. Um, so a couple questions came up about um, FireWise. Some, a uh, couple questions were um, coming in about those deciduous plants that might drop some of their foliage. What, in doing so, does that prevent, um, create a fire hazard? So the answer to that is yes. So you do, we, I, what I want to remind everybody is that we are planning a talk on firescaping coming up in November. So we're going to go into that into in a little bit more de detail in an upcoming talk. But yes, twigginess can be a fire hazard. A lot of plants that are drought adapted, fire is part of the Mediterranean climate. Um, so a lot of plants will burn. A lot of plants as an adaptation to drought have a high oil content in their leaves. Um, for example, rosemary. All of those plants that are very fragrant often have a high oil content. Um, oil is going to be more flammable. And of course, with a plant like rosemary, it can get very twiggy and very woody. So um, there needs to be care taken in choosing drought tolerant plants that are um, going to be um, fire resistant. And I want to also want to remind everybody that if the fire is hot enough, anything will burn. So um, it really is about making best choices. Great. Good information. So on the flip side of the fire, what about the occasional wet years that we get? How do the plants that you've talked through handle those occasional wet years? So it depends. If the plants are, if it's really, really wet, the plants might suffer. They might rot out a little bit if the soils are completely saturated. It depends on the plant. It depends on the soil. It depends on the location. In really wet years, some of the plants may actually have accelerated growth. They may have bigger leaves. They may grow faster. Um, if the soil is super soggy, they may have some root rot. So it really is um, location and location specific. Okay, great, thank you. There's a question about soil. Is there a typical type of soil that plants grow best in, in a Mediterranean climate? Oh, that's a really interesting question. One of the things that is um, pretty interesting about Mediterranean climate is that our soils, and this is certainly true in Contra Costa County and Alameda County, our soils tend to be low in nitrogen. And that is typical of Mediterranean climate. So plants often, um, especially, you know, interestingly enough in Australia, there are a lot of plants that are in the pea family. Um, pea plants, um, acacias, for example, are able to um, get 
nitrogen and fix it and make it available into the soil. So nitrogen is a, a whole nother topic, but Mediterranean plant Mediterranean soils typically are low in nitrogen, and so the plants are going to be adapted to lower nutrient soils. Great. Okay, question about pruning. When is the best time to prune drought resistors? So with pruning, um, one of the things to understand about pruning is that when you prune a plant, it triggers the plant to want to grow. So typically you do not want to prune in the summertime because if you have a plant and you're um, watering it, you know, giving it a minimum or no water, once you prune it, it's gonna trigger the plant to push out new growth. And by pushing out that new growth, it's gonna need more water. So the best time to prune is going to be later um, when the plants are starting to grow in the spring or when they're dormant. Um, a lot of salvias and things, if they're especially, if they're getting to looking, or lavenders get a little bit woody and they get kind of dead and ugly at the bottom, um, it's better to plant to prune those in the late winter or early spring when they're getting ready, gearing up, being ready to grow. Great, perfect. Um, last question for you. Um, you showed on one of the succulents, the Farinos powders. Um, the question came in is, does that hurt the plant? And if it does, what can you do to help it? So I think you're asking whether or not the, if the powder gets wiped off, does That's it hurt correct. the plant? Yes, you got it. Yes. And the answer to that is that it does hurt the plant because it, 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 the powder is acting like a sunscreen. So if you wipe the powder off, or you, I can make an analogy, if you've ever put on sunscreen and missed a spot and then gotten sunburned, that's what's gonna happen with the plant. When that powder is wiped off, it um, opens the plant to sunburn and sun scald. And unfortunately, the plant is not able to um, make more powder and, and heal itself there. So I don't know if there's really anything you can do except be um, tolerant of having plants that may have some leaves that may look a little scorched or a little bit burned. The rest of the leaf is gonna be okay because it's under the, the powder. So it really is an aesthetic concern. And if too much of the leaf is exposed to sunlight, it's gonna get sun scald and burn and it probably will die and drop off. And that will open up um, an opportunity for the plant when the conditions are right, perhaps to put on some new leaves. So the plant will take care of itself. Great. Okay. Well, that is all the questions we have time for. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'm just going to do a couple closing of where you guys, um, everyone here can get some more information to answer some of your questions. If we go to the next slide. So our health desk, we've put the health desk's email address in the chat box. Um, our health desk is here if you have, oops, that's the next uh, slide, excuse me. Our health desk is currently email only, and I'm going to get you some information on that in the next slide. But our website, if you haven't already been there, has, a, I mean, a lot of really, really great information from upcoming events and webinars like this, other programs in our community, and um, just a lot of really great gardening resources. So if you haven't already, I encourage you to go check that out. And um, if we go to the next slide, I'll share a little bit about our um, how to follow us. So we also post information about our programs and events um, on social media. This um, video, this of today's um, presentation will be posted in YouTube in a couple weeks. We will um, send everyone who registered, whether you attended or not tonight, the link once that is up and posted, as well as the handout. We have a really great handout that we'll be sending um, that with a lot of great information and links, um, including places to look for plants um, such as Dawn described today. But you could also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, um, YouTube, as well as Instagram. And promised you information on our help desk. The next slide, and we've posted in the uh, chat box our help desk email address. 
this is a really great resource for you if you have a question that is related to your um, home, garden, um, whatever it may be, this is a really great resource. Send these folks at our help desk an email. Um, include information like your name, phone number, what city you live in, a description, and if you have pictures, we would love them. And our folks will um, do research and provide you with some great information back uh, to help you with your, your, um, your question. 